There is no anime out there quite like My Hero Academia. It's my favorite anime, no question. And this season, Toki's show that I've loved for years and twisted it just slightly, creating a season that was exciting, emotional, thought-provoking, and quite possibly the best season yet. Now this review will contain spoilers because I really don't think you'd be watching a review for season 6 if you cared about spoilers. So, but that's your warning. So what made this season so great? Well, it was just an amazing example of how my hero told its stories. And that's how it weaves many smaller stories together. The first arc of the season, known as the Paranormal Liberation Arc, wasn't just a story focused on a single character, but instead most of the cast, pushing all of their stories forward, though some in bigger ways than others. And I love that it wasn't just showing them as heroes, but also as people. Though, let's talk about them as heroes first, because that was really cool. One of the things I loved about the season was how many characters got moments to really shine and be awesome. Even minor ones, like if Kaminari absorbs a big electric blast at the start of the raid against the Paranormal Liberation Army, then you have a Tsukiyomi swooping in to save Hawks, Yaya Rozo creating a tranquilizer, all the heroes teaming up to uh, take down Gigantomachina, and then you even had Mount Lady holding on to Gigantomachina to slow him down, giving Yaya Rozo time to create the tranquilizer and get everything set up. Then during the raid of the hospital, you had like Mirko, a character who's pretty much been in the background, really got a chance to shine fighting the Nomu. You have President Mike giving a very satisfying punch to the evil doctor. And there's a ton of great moments for a lot of other characters in the battle against Shigaraki. We saw this later in the season two with Muscular's return. Sure, that fight was really just Deku showing how strong he'd become, but while that was the focus, we also saw how much grand weakened Muscular, making it so that Deku's 45% punch was enough to win, when before even 100% wasn't enough. So even random side characters there just to like build up Deku ended up having a cool moment that mattered to them. Then there's Best Genus who stole the scene any time he was there. I actually did not remember him being that memorable of a character before. Like he was just a hero who was there and seemed to be pretty cool, I guess. Here it seemed like every line he had was really inspirational and also a great pun, which that was just awesome. But I think one of the best characters this season was Bakugo. While he wasn't really the focus often, he really demonstrated how much he has grown since the beginning and really demonstrated how much of a hero he's become. One of the great things about long range shows is how they can stretch out character arcs, and that's what's happened with Bakugo. He started off really arrogant and prideful, thinking he was super strong because, well, compared to everyone else, he was. But then he lost that fight against Deku during the training mission back in Season 1. Then in Season 2, he was the winner of the sports festival, but that was only because Todoroki held back. Then in Season 3, he was one of the two people in the class to fail the professional licensing exam. It wasn't because he wasn't strong enough, but he missed out on the most important thing about being a hero, which was a desire to save others. Though that was his low point, it's since then he's been growing. In Season 4, we got those episodes with him reaching out to the kids during his remedial courses. Then in Season 5, Bakugo led the rest of Class A to dominate Class B during their match. And what was so great about Bakugo there wasn't that he was super strong, but also that he relied on his classmates. He's really learned and grown as a person. Then here in Season 6, he gets a chance to really shine in the Paranormal Liberation Army battles. When Deku goes to lure Shigaraki away from his civilians, Bakugo instantly joins him, and without thinking, takes all for one's attack that could have killed Deku. The scene was so cool because it used the same words as Episode 2, when All Might talked about how heroes became great, and that was that their bodies moved before they had a chance to think, and that's what Bakugo did. There's a beautiful irony here too, in that Bakugo is a big fan of All Might, but he doesn't know about All Might's words to Deku back in Season 1. So without trying to, or even being conscious of it, he's still embodying the heroism that All Might represents. This is made even stronger by the fact that Bakugo blames himself for All Might needing to retire. It's just like so incredible how many layers there are to this. And I love how perspective we see Bakugo be in this season. The reason he followed Deku was that he knew that Deku wasn't going to think of himself, so Bakugo needed to go to make sure someone was there thinking about Deku. Then in the Dark Hero arc, Bakugo was the one who figured out Deku was with the pro heroes and put together the plan to go after him. And what I love about Bakugo's development is that it's pretty subtle. On the outside, Bakugo is still the same person he was before, loud, hot-headed, stubborn. But his heart has grown. Like, he would yelling at everyone in the hospital, but he's yelling to find out about everyone else. He even threatens to kill Deku if he dies, which is the most Bakugo line ever. And I love the dynamic between Bakugo and Best Genist here. 
The moment when Bestina's called Bakugo by his hero name, despite how ridiculous it was, was just amazing. It shows the respect that Bakugo and Best Genius have for each other. And what's crazy is that these aren't even Bakugo-focused arcs, but they were still able to do so much with them. And while mostly in the background, I also want to mention Ochako. I keep wanting to see her team more, have some big moments too, and I'm sad whenever she doesn't get that. I was excited to see her get a fight against Togi here, though that in a sort of anticlimactically. So it was only after the big battle ended that I understood what her role is meant to be. The point of a hero is to save people. It wasn't sometimes involves big fleshy fights, just as often it doesn't. After the big fight was over, she was rescuing people caught under the rubble from all the devastation, and she certainly saved lives, making a hero just as much as all the others, in a way that can save lives when other people can't. So I still wanted to get some big moments. I did appreciate what we got here. But after I wrote that, uh, we got episode 137, where she gave her big speech to those protesting Deku's return to UA. And I think this shows the type of hero she is even more. She pays attention to those around her, and more importantly, to their hearts. And with that, she knows the right action to take. Again, she's not going to be a super strong hero punching all the bad guys. But her strength lies elsewhere. It's like Principal Nez has said, some people refuse to take the extra steps to understand others. Not Ochaka, though, and that's what makes her a hero. Then there is Deku. His character development throughout the season was so incredibly powerful and heartbreaking. Uh, though I'm not even sure you could call it development, because that implies character growth, and though in a way, Deku went the opposite direction, letting the negative parts of his personality dominate. What I love about this is how the show turned Deku's greatest strength into his greatest weakness. From the very start of the show, Deku has been incredibly selfless and incredibly determined, willing to throw himself in danger if that meant saving someone else. And because of that, he has saved so many people, both physically and their hearts as well. Then the last part of the season, we see he nearly got him killed by a villain he should have had no trouble defeating. But because he pushed everyone else away to protect them, and because he refused to take care of himself, he was too worn out to do anything. Despite all the ways he's grown throughout the season, in strength and confidence and intelligence, his determination and love for others has blinded him to his own weakness. Bakugo had a great line back in season 4 when he was talking to the kids at the remedial class, which was, if you keep looking down on everyone, you're never going to notice your own weakness. And that's the mistake Deku made here. By this point of the story, Deku is incredibly powerful, quite possibly the strongest hero alive. And he said that the others couldn't keep up with him. He didn't say this out of malice or not viewing them as people, but out of his own desire to protect them. Though in doing so, he failed to learn the lesson Bakugo did, and let his own weakness nearly lead to his demise. Another interesting aspect of this is what pushed Deku to this point. All throughout the series, All Might had been putting a ton of pressure on Deku to be a successor. We saw this back in Season 2 of the Sports Festival, and then in Season 3 by seeing it was his turn. And then you have All for One, taking all the pressure All Might put Deku under in the fear of his friends being hurt, and using All Might's words to turn that all into terror. It's no wonder Deku was so broken and would do anything to keep his friends away. He would said that if he went back, it would be as if he killed them himself. And then when he finally gets back to UA, you have all the people telling him to stay away. Let's talk about that fight between Deku and Class 1A, because I think it's one of my favorite fights in all of anime. Well, it's not because the fight itself is that great, but because of the stories told through the fight. It starts off with Bakugo asking if Deku is able to smile right now. That shows what's at stake here, and it's Deku's heart. Especially when you see the Deku as the successor of All Might, who always see people to smile. And here's Deku, waiting to see people, but not able to smile. And I love how every attack the class uses is accompanied by a memory of how Deku is helping them. It showed the bond that they all had with him. Like you have Ida reflecting on the battle with Stain. Ida even had a great line here about being a hero meant meddling when they didn't need to, which is what all the class is doing here. And what Deku did for Ida back in season two. And I also loved Mineta here, how he was talking about how much he looked up to Deku when Deku was so weak. Back in the beginning of the show, Deku was super weak, but he fought anyway and found ways to overcome his weakness, and that's what Minata found so inspiring. I really loved how the whole class was using their quirks to keep up with Deku as he tried to run away, and during the fight, Deku says that they weren't able to keep up with him in a metaphorical sense, but that also became very literal. The whole class worked together to sit and to eat a flying fast enough that he could catch up with Deku, 
Throw that together, they could keep up in a literal sense. And then throughout this arc, you kept having Deku say he wanted to reach out his hand to villains, give them a chance. But the battle ended here with Ida grabbing Deku's reached out hand. I just love seeing this, all the different ideas and character journeys coming together here. Then there are all the other ideas on display throughout the story. One of the most interesting was the blurred lines between heroes and villains, along with society's view of heroes. When it started, My Hero was a show that seemed to portray itself as a celebration of the ideals of superheroes. But there are also cracks in the ideals shown. That's what Stain was all about. He wanted to kill the fake heroes who were just in for selfish reasons. Though he was defeated and seemed to be forgotten, the story just continued on without him. But what he stood for resonated throughout the rest of the series, with many villains inspired by Stain. Then at the start of the season, we probably get the most blurred line between heroes and villains with the battle between Twice and Hawks. Twice is someone who's trusting of those around him, wanting nothing more than for his friends to be happy and willing to sacrifice himself to do so. He's a selfless person, grateful for all that he's been blessed with. Then you have Hawks, a liar who's willing to abandon the people at the bottom, a dog of the government, willing to kill to serve his masters. It makes you question who the true hero and villain are here. At least when it's portrayed like that. And that's the thing. A slight perspective switch can make it unclear who is good, who is evil. And that's something the villains do all the time. Twist the truth just a little to make their viewpoint seem logical. But it's not just the villains who do this. We see this with Lady Nagans and her battle with Deku when she talks about her time in the public safety commission. How they spun the narrative of society, hiding the facts they didn't want the public to know about. And given what she's been through and her guilt at all the killings, it's no wonder she would see society as corrupt, one worthy of being taken down. She called it brainwashing by omission, and she's right. If you can't trust society to be truthful, how can you trust them about anything? And it's no wonder people lose faith in society. Then there's also one of the most powerful images of the show, which is the statue of All Might, with the sign, I am not here. They took a symbol of hope and turned it into a symbol of fear. But as much as the show is exploring this gray area, viewing the ideals of heroes through a more cynical lens, Deku gets a great line here that I feel captures the message of the whole show. And that is, nothing is truly black and white. Society exists in a gray area, swirling with anxiety and anger. But despite that, and because of that, he has to keep reaching out his hand. My hero takes place in a fantastical world filled with superpowers. But swirling with anxiety and anger? That sounds just like our world. Then there's the green costly falling of this arc makes that whole world feel gray, just like our world. Or maybe that's just Ohio in April. But then you have Deku saying he's going to keep reaching out his hand, and him seeing these words as an acknowledgement that heroes can still make a difference. And we see throughout the season the impact Deku has had. Like when Todoroku's reflecting on Dobby, learning that Dobby was his older brother, how he could have seen himself going down the same path if not for Deku. And while a bit different, we see this with Endeavor and Hawks too. How Endeavor arrested Hawks' dad, which was the first time a hero became real to Hawks. And this despite how flawed Endeavor is. But even so, he saved a person's heart in a way he couldn't have imagined. And taking this a step further, you know the way Hawks looked up twice as we saw in episode 129. This seems crazy that Hawks looked up to the villain that he killed, but it shows that even if Twice chose the wrong side, he can still influence people to do good. And going back to that All Might statue, in episode 136, when the class is about to fight Deku, they are standing in front of this statue, showing that while All Might might not be here anymore, there are still heroes fighting for the heart of someone they love. Though I can't talk about more of the gray areas without talking more about Endeavor. He is the number one hero in the nation, and this is a choice that feels very intentional by the writers. He is so great, and yet he's done horrible things. So what does that say about the rest of heroes in society? I find the discussion about Endeavor Online really interesting, because a great argument can be made for him being both a wonderful person, but also a terrible person. He saved those he didn't know, but hurt those who loved him. And the fact that Shigaraki's quote in 121 fits him so well is no coincidence. It's a tough question, though. Like, does all the bad he's done cancel out the good? Or does the good cancel out the bad? Though I think the answer to both those questions is no. And I think that's the answer this show is presenting too. Give redemption arcs a uh, common in anime, and they are great, don't get me wrong. But what I love about Endeavor's story here is that 
He's striving to be a better person for his family, but it's not like his failures just go away. His mistakes shape Dobby into the villain he is, and that's something he can't just undo by trying to be a good person now. The past cannot be changed. That's the bad news. But do you know what the good news is? Is that the past cannot be changed. What, you thought I'd say that something about the future can still be changed? I mean, that's true, but we're not talking about my favorite Sith Bugger song in this video. Though I guess now we kind of are. Instead, we're talking about my hero. And this season spent a lot of time focusing on the mistakes of the past and how they don't go away. Across many different characters, not just Endeavor. But likewise, the good done in the past doesn't go away. Endeavor may have caused irreparable harm to his family, leading to one of his sons becoming a villain. But he also arrested Hawk's dad, leading Hawks to become a hero. We see this with the One for All holders too. How their sacrifice, how their hard work, how all the good that they have done have given Deku the power he now has. In episode 137, we see that woman Deku saved along with Koda rushing towards him because of the things Deku did in the past. We see the entire class go after Deku because of the kindness he has shown in the past. Deku says he can't go back to the old me, and that's true. But he also cannot undo all the good he has done. With all the uncertainty of the future, the fact that the past cannot be changed is in many ways a good thing, because it lays the foundation to build the future upon. Another thing I've loved this season is the fact that the heroes lost in the Paranormal Liberation Army arc. Now you could say the villains lost as well since a lot of the Paranormal Liberation Army was arrested, but even then, the villains unleashed unimaginable destruction, killed multiple heroes, wounded many others, and perhaps more importantly, destroyed the image of heroes in the world. Then after that battle, all for one attacks of prisons, unleashing many more villains out into the streets. Then many of the pro heroes quit after all the backlash they got from society. And really, can you blame them? Like if I was trying my best at my job, trying to help people, and this only led to me getting pelted with insults, I'd consider quitting too. It would really take a special person not to. But it keeps coming back to this idea. The crowd doesn't want Deku to come back to the school because they're afraid he'll attract villains. They see him as a hero who will bring danger to the school. And the whole idea here of taking the steps to understand people really underscores how great of a hero Deku is. He doesn't just fight villains, but seeks to reach out to them. We saw that back in Season 2 with Todoroki, and these seasons saw it with Muscular and even Shigaraki. Just like one of my other favorite anime protagonists, he's always willing to reach out to and understand how others. But again, this isn't a Sifo Gear video. What I find interesting, though, is the question of if Deku is right to do this with Shigaraki. Like back in Season 2, Todoroki wasn't a villain and wasn't putting anyone in danger. And while Muscular was hurting people and causing damage now, it wasn't like he was that dangerous considering how strong Deku is. Shigaraki, though, has killed tons of people and it doesn't seem like the heroes can match him in power. And if Deku passes up an opportunity to kill him, countless others could die as well. But on the other hand, if heroes had not abandoned Shigaraki in the past, he wouldn't be the villain he is today. So this is a tough decision. And I like that Deku acknowledged that he was willing to kill Shigaraki, if that's what it comes down to. The never killing ideal is something I've seen in a lot of media about heroes, and really, it is a good ideal. Much better than the alternative. But if the story doesn't also show the challenges of this ideal, they come across as overly naive and lead to the story coming across as patronizing if things just happen to go the right way for a hero to not need to kill. Let's look back at the aftermath of the battle and the views of society on heroes because of that. And looking back at all the aftermath of the battle against the villains, the society really sees heroes as failures because of the damage they caused. But as the viewer, we saw the battle and saw the effort every single hero put in that fight. They were willing to sacrifice anything and everything if it meant that they could defeat the villains. The heroes truly embody what it meant to be a hero. It's so infuriating to see people criticize the heroes for not doing their jobs well enough when these people did nothing more than sit at homes and watch TV. That's the point, though. It's supposed to make us mad because we see how wrong these people are. There's a not-so-subtle critique of the media here, how they're all about amplifying the fear and anger in society. Like, go to any big news website, and most of what you'll see is trying to play into the anger and the fear. Here, we see a bunch of reporters just trying to get a good sound bite to make themselves sound smart and good. While you have the heroes actually out there fighting to make the world a better place. And one of the big themes of the show is the question of what it means to be a hero. 
This season, we see many different angles of that. It's the instinct to rush in to save others, the heart to see other people as the humans they are, the wisdom to assess the situation, the preparation to allow for the right action to be taken when the time is right. But there's another theme, the opposite of that, what it means to be a villain. I've been really wondering about this because it started to explore the theme in season five, but I couldn't quite put my hand on what does it mean to be a villain. But I think I figured it out here. To be a villain is to destroy. We see this with Shigaraki's quirk, obviously. But again, I feel like this is an intentional choice, giving him a quirk that just destroys. Being a villain is about rejecting the world society has built, to destroy it. What's interesting here is that sometimes being a villain is the morally right thing. If society is truly corrupt, then maybe the right thing is to destroy it to build something better. And that's why many of the villains become villains. They feel that society is so terrible that their only course of action is to destroy it. Though there are other villains who have less altruistic motives, like you have all for one taking advantage of these other villains in their somewhat noble desire to build society in a way that serves him. Quite fitting for his name, all for one. Then there is Toga, whose battle with Ochaka revealed a lot about her mindset. She says it's hard to be her, and that ignoring the urges only makes them worse. This shows that she is self-centered, views herself as a victim, and acts just based off her desires, the opposite of someone who acts out of concern for others. I feel like we're going to get more of this idea in the future too, and I'm curious how they'll tie it all together. Then something else I found interesting was the callbacks with all the visuals and music here. There are a couple scenes in particular that were presented as an obvious homage to earlier in this series, but in a way that felt off, at least at first. The first of these was the song Might Bless You at the end of episode 126. In this scene, we saw all the destruction of the battle, which seemed to be a very weird time to play a song about the dedication of heroes. But watching the scene again, I saw that the song actually started when Deku was thinking about how Shigaraki wanted to be saved, not unlike his determination to save Aerie back in season 4 when the song was first played. Then as the song builds, we see all the heroes hurt, which again, is weird. But as I think about them more, I see this as a celebration of the hero's sacrifice, that despite all the damage the villains took caused, their sacrifices were not in vain. Then the shot at the end of the episode is a bright sky, which seems to be symbolizing hope, even if the sky will soon be covered in gray. But then another episode with a lot of callbacks was episode 137, Ochako's speech, which had a ton of similarities to episode 2, where Deku was told that he could become a hero. As Ochako's speech reached the end, the You Can Be a Hero music started playing, and Deku just fell to his knees, overwhelmed by it all, just like with All Might. Then as Koda ran to Deku, there was the shot of his red shoes, just like when Deku ran to Bakugo to save him from the slime monster. You even have the exact same shot of Deku falling to his knees in front of uh, Koda and the Nameless Woman, framed in the exact same way, in the same art style, as the end of episode 2. Then we got the reveal of the story. That's not just how Deku became the world's greatest hero, but the story of how they all do. This part, just flat out incredible. But why frame it the way they did? Why make this feel so much like episode 2 It's so just a new thing? And I was curious when I read these two chapters in the manga, saw that the parallels weren't as strong there, though there were a couple of things that were still linked. So why did the studio lean on this so much, other than the fact that they knew it would be really emotional and all that? I think a big part of it is Deku's words, that this isn't just the story of him becoming the greatest hero anymore, but of all of them becoming the greatest heroes. There's also the tie that both scenes are when Deku was broken by the words of someone else. There's also the connection about how All for One has a power to connect people. Episode 2 is the connection being formed between All Might and Deku, and now it's between Deku and everyone else. It could also be that this episode reflects the start of all of them becoming heroes, while well, episode 2 was the start of Deku becoming a hero, though that doesn't quite make sense because the rest of the class are already heroes and have been for multiple arcs, though maybe it's more how Deku views them? I don't know, it's a bit weird. But we do see a refrain throughout uh, this whole arc of the school being called Our Hero Academia, opening songs titled literally translating to ours, which fits the idea of them all becoming great heroes. So I'm also wondering if the full symbolism isn't seen quite yet. And then the season closed out with an incredible return of Stain and the encounter he had with All Might. I actually wrote everything above this with 
with the exception of a couple of edits before I saw that episode. So I'm just going to talk about this episode here at the end instead of like working it all in because this script is way too long. And I'd be recording for over half an hour at this point. This will be fun to edit. So yes, we have the final episode with an encounter between Stain and All Might. It seemed weird that Stain would be such an impactful villain for like in season two and then kind of just go away. Though I think the way that they used him made more sense. It's better to use them sparingly so that they can really make a difference when they want to. And what more fitting way to use him than to drive forward All Might's story. What's so fascinating here is that All Might is having to deal with living a life without being a hero, that after that being his identity for so long, he is no longer able to portray that persona. This is a very unique character arc. I found it interesting how Stan called him a fake at first, despite knowing the truth. The scene was really impactful because we saw how much everything has weighed down All Might, how he blames himself for all the damage the villains caused. He views himself as a failure, unable to do anything for his disciple. Something I found really interesting too is that Stan called All Might a fake, which is the same thing Deku did back in the start of episode 2 after seeing his true form. Granted, Deku did that wild confusion while Stain saying that was more intentional, but I still feel like this was an intentional parallel. Then you have Stain claiming that All Might is fake, not because he's not the person of All Might, but he's not the hero of All Might. Then the woman comes out and cleans the statue, the last person that All Might saved. Then Stain gives All Might a speech that brings him to tears. And I love that it was Stain who did that, a villain being the one to inspire All Might. There's also a connection to the past here, with how the first person All Might saved in Season 1 later inspired him to act, and now the last person he saved is inspiring him again. And there's also a connection here with Stain being the villain inspiring All Might, not unlike twice was to Hawks. Then like so many other characters this season, there's a question of if Stain is a good guy or not. He killed 40 heroes, but it was to make a world a better place, and while we don't know all the reasons why, this season we learn about other heroes who took lives. So is Stain really worse than them? And I love that throughout everything that they're going through, we see how good a people of Deku and All Might are really wanting to take care of others. Like you have All Might making those bentos for Deku, which is just so precious. This show really is great. It is my favorite anime, and this is my favorite season so far. And I love how rich it is, how there are so many aspects that build on each other. All the different character journeys, the ideas explored, how it's using the fantasy world to comment on our world. All the individual story threads are woven together into a tapestry of a story, and yes, I sound like Best Genius, and yes, that is intentional, because that's the point. Small actions, small aspects come together to create something great. And that created a season and a series that is so exciting, filled with emotional impact from sorrow to hope. And maybe I am overthinking some of these points, that's certainly possible. But I think that's also a testament of the show's quality too, that it rewards the deeper look, and that lets it provide a richer experience than just a show with some cool action. Really is fantastic. So let me know your thoughts. Did I miss anything that stood out to you? Let me know. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for watching. I will be back, I don't know, in the future, with hopefully a video shorter than this one, though I make no promises. Talk to you then.